this week on Vaticano, recall with us the great doctor of the church, St. Robert Bellarmine, and discover how his thoughts influenced the creation of the United States and the modern world. The extraordinary missionary month of October is quickly approaching. Meet the cardinal who's leading the church's evangelization efforts. But first, we'll tell you about a week in the life of the Pope. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. A few days before departing on his apostolic voyage to Africa, Pope Francis met with about 40 bishops who were in Rome for their spiritual exercises. <laughs> the spiritual exercises for bishops in Rome have been established by Pope Francis to reinforce their Episcopal ministry. The exercises are held once a year for bishops who are celebrating five and six years of consecration. Gathering with the Pope, the bishops presented themselves one by one, a chance for them to meet and share a moment with the successor of Peter. The synod is not a parliament, and if there's no Holy Spirit, there's no synod. These words were pronounced by Pope Francis to the bishops of the Synod of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Around 50 bishops came from Ukraine and different countries around the world for a synodal meeting. This year marks 90 years since their first synod was held in Rome and 50 years since the consecration of Rome's Ukrainian Greek Catholic co-cathedral of St. Sophia. The Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church is the biggest Eastern Church that continues the Eastern tradition while being in full communion with Rome. At a meeting with the Italian Association of Oncologists, Pope Francis spoke strongly against euthanasia. He said that the practice of euthanasia is intended to promote personal freedom, but in reality it's based on a utilitarian view of the person. At the audience among the doctors, some patients were also participating. The Holy Father offered the patients a look at the suffering of Christ as an example. Pope Francis praised the association for their focus on the individual patient rather than on illness and called this approach the oncology of mercy. Pope Francis received a delegation from the Middle East Council of Churches headed by Secretary General Dr. Suraya Becelani. She offered Pope Francis an icon of St. Ignatius of Antioch, which represents the mission of their organization, a symbol of unity among Christians. During the 40-minute meeting, the Pope praised the efforts of the Secretary General and reminded her and the delegation that the Church is also a woman. Dr. Becelani pronounced an exceptional wish for His Holiness to launch a Third Vatican Council in the Third Millennium to face Third Millennium issues, on which the Pope replied, pray for me, because this isn't easy. Pope Francis met with Catholic Focolare Movement President Maria Voce and co-president Jesus Moran in a private audience. Voce gave the Pope a Russian icon called Joy of All the Afflicted that belonged to Focolare foundress Chiara Lubich and a book of her conversations. The Pope encouraged the community to carry her prophecies forward into the world. Founded by Chiara Lubich in 1943, the Focolare movement operates now in 180 countries and has over 140,000 members. The main goal of the movement is to promote unity among nations to build brotherhood. The increasing hostility towards migrants and refugees, especially in European societies, remains a hot topic here at the UN in Geneva. Monsignor Robert Vitillo, president of the International Catholic Migration Commission, called to mind Pope Francis, who has labeled the crisis a two-way street. On the occasion of the launch of a new publication on causes and consequences of migration today, the Geneva Center for Human Rights organized this panel at the UN in Geneva. The two themes, migration and human solidarity, and protecting people on the move. The head of the International Catholic Migration Commission spoke about the role of the Catholic Church. Efforts also need to be made to prevent individuals from being constrained to abandon their families and countries and to allow them to return safely and with full respect for their dignity and human rights. 
All human beings long for a better and more prosperous life, and the challenge of migration cannot be met with a mindset of violence and indifference, nor by offering merely partial solutions. First of all, the Catholic Church needs to teach about the situation of migrants, and also it needs to call attention in its teaching to the unique dignity of all people, including migrants, and then encourage people to respond in a just and fair and accepting way. For the International Catholic Migration Commission, we uh, join many organizations and religious orders that specialize in care and service to migrants and refugees. We do that in a number of ways. One is that we form a network of Catholic organizations and especially of the National Bishops' Conferences in helping them learn about the migration situation. We also do it uh, through advocacy, global advocacy, especially with the United Nations, uh, advocating for just policies toward migrants and refugees. And then finally, we have our own humanitarian assistance programs. Many of those programs today are are focused in the Middle East and also in Pakistan, uh, where we still have large numbers of refugees uh, needing help, uh, both from humanitarian assistance and help in finding durable solutions like resettlement to other countries when they cannot return home safely or cannot be integrated within the countries of asylum. The purpose of this panel was to assess the causes and consequences of forced displacement of people in Europe and across the Arabian region, and the reasons behind the fear surrounding the coming of migrants. It's probably part of our sinful uh, condition of original sin that people often are afraid of things that are different uh, and, and of people who are different. And so I think that's part of the situation. But also I think there's uh, been a major thrust in the world today, a kind of toxic uh, rhetoric about migrants and refugees. Some of it comes from the terrorism that we face. There's also some political motivations by leaders who want to to, uh, reject migrants and refugees in their countries. I think the antidote is to get to know migrants and refugees, and that's what Pope Francis encourages us to do. Many states have signed the so-called Global Compact for Migration, which was designed to help orderly and lawful management of migrants. Still, there's a challenge to it being accepted and implemented. I think that's another important role for the church and for organizations like ICMC uh, to really uh, monitor the implementation and to remind heads of state and other officials about their obligation and then also to do our part in being sure that we welcome refugees and migrants in all parts of the world and we offer them decent living conditions and peaceful environments. Solutions are obviously hard to find. While on a political level, debates about how to best address the crisis continue, the Holy See is trying to insert the humanity and dignity of migrants back into the discussion. On September the 17th, every year, the church honors one of the greatest teachers of the faith, St. Robert Bellarmine. He happened to live in a time of confusion in the Christian world and had to deal with problems that arose during the Protestant Reformation. He was the spiritual father of St. Aloysius Gonzaga. Both are now entombed in Rome's St. Ignatius Church. Fellow Jesuit, Father Mitch Paqua, says he admires St. Robert Bellarmine's ability to learn and explains that Bellarmine's knowledge was one of the reasons he was proclaimed a doctor of the church. Knowing a lot does not make one a saint. But the way he used his magnificent intellectual capacity is what made him a saint. The doctors of the church are able to offer us solid doctrine, and that's exactly what he did. He 
had studied philosophy and theology. He knew the biblical languages. He brought all of that together in his answers to the different Protestants. So he wrote a catechism that explained the faith clearly and in a well-organized way. Secondly, he also wrote Disputaciones. This is a book that dealt with all the various topics mentioned by the various ref and he would respond to them in orderly ways using scripture first and then the fathers of the church and the church tradition and showing where they had made mistakes. In his disputation with King James, a book was written by the royal theologian, a book written against Robert Bellarmine. This book was called The Patriarcha, and it defended the divine right of kings against Robert Bellarmine's books. What's important is that Filmer, who was the author of this book, was refuting Bellarmine, but he had to cite Bellarmine's writings, correct? Well, what's interesting is that the book Patriarcha was in the library of Thomas Jefferson, who later on wrote the Declaration of Independence and became president of the United States. That idea that government belongs to the people and is given to the people by God is Robert Bellarmine's idea. And as we deal with some of the same issues with various Protestant communities that we once had, we can learn from his answers and charitable approach. But we can also then apply that to the various issues of the modern time. We have new atheism and disagreement with the existence of God, misunderstanding of the state being the center of rights and the, the, the source of human rights, and that this has been a devastating problem in the 20th century where 305 million people were killed in wars or by their own governments who believed that the state had all the rights, and they didn't. We can learn that and apply that to our own times today and do so with the same love of Christ, love of the church, and love of our opponents, as Robert Bellarmine did. And that is an example that we very much need this day. we'll give you a look ahead to the extraordinary missionary month of October. Extraordinary Missionary Month of October, convoked by Pope Francis. The whole church is being called to participate. We met with the Prefect of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, Cardinal Fernando Filoni, to talk about how the Missionary Month is going to be celebrated in Rome. 
Beh, intanto, intanto il Santo Padre è il primo di ottobre. First of all, the Holy Father will make Vespers on the 1st of October, on the day of St. Therese of the Child Jesus. This is the first appointment. Then there will be the Missionary Rosary on October 8th. It will be in world view through Radio Maria. Then we will have the Synod. That is almost a missionary reality. If we think that over 30 ecclesiastical circumscriptions of the Amazon depend on our congregation, we will then also have the canonization after the World Missionary Day, among which there are also some new saints who actually come from the missionary world. The important thing is that this month arouses a conscience, a missionary interest, and this awareness that baptism enables me. Baptized and sent is the theme of this missionary month. Cardinal Bergoglio, Pope Francis, had launched this great initiative, baptism as a missionary work, when he was in Argentina. Is baptism today in a secularized world that sees it as proselytism still missionary work? Well, baptism is the end of the journey. It is not the baptism of those who arrive and baptize, but it is the baptism of those who are present in a certain place, who create the conditions for interpersonal relationships. Why do you do all this? What is it that brings you to leaving your country to come here and do all of this? Well, the gospel drives me. What is the gospel? Here, then, is the catechesis that forms, therefore, the people who adhere will then come to baptism as the final phase of this first approach. The methodology of the gospel, the proposal of the gospel, must be permanent in the vision of the evangelization of the church. So any form of proselytism, hoarding, occupation, so to speak, of spirits, souls of people, is neither evangelical nor even less acceptable. So here we see the difference too, because even the methodology of the missionaries must take into account the realities of the place and not overlap. In this sense, I believe that missionary activity itself also changes, as it is no longer only the missionaries who are sent, of which they have been the spearhead of, but every baptized person. If I receive baptism, if I love baptism, if I believe that my faith is a gift, a wealth, I myself become a missionary. Faith cannot selfishly be something to keep to oneself, but it is communicated. This can be a form of witness, but it can also be a more demanding form, that of vocation where the gospel has not yet arrived. Then here the facets of how the baptized person can witness, announce, and share his faith comes into play. Può testimoniare la sua fede, annunciare la sua fede, condividere la sua fede. How much are witnesses needed today? You spoke of missionaries almost like professionals, but witnesses? The testimony is not a package. I have it, you don't have it. This yes, this no. I believe that here too. We should also have a less sociological dimension and a little more spiritual. After all, the witness never knows that he is a witness but it is the Holy Spirit of God who awakens in the people. Ways, behaviors, ways of being and whoever receives it, welcomes it also through a supernatural grace that makes you see diversity. I often tell a little anecdote that I really like. When Matteo Ricci was in China, we remember him because he is a great Western figure, but I always say it, it would be like walking with one leg. That's not walking, it's jumping. You have to add a second leg that in this case is a Chinese person. Zhu Guanghui, who was a Mandarin, was the vice minister in the imperial court, a man who had really welcomed the faith in an extraordinarily beautiful way. When the emperor said to him, but you who are Mandarin, why did you become a Christian? What have you not found in our culture? And he goes straight to the heart of the matter and says to the emperor, I became a Christian because we have so much culture, but it is our culture. What the gospel tells us is not a culture. It is a gift that comes to us from above. It is a supernatural gift that we cannot have. The emperor says to him, what does this mean? He gives an example. The forgiveness of the enemy is not human. Forgiving is not human. Forgiving the enemy can only be a gift from God that enlightens your heart, your mind, and you accept it. The emperor was impressed by this fact. 
Zhu Guangqi had given all his possessions to the poor, all of them. When he died, it was found necessary to have a great funeral, as befits a Mandarin deputy minister. They had no money. They had to collect it to have the funeral. The emperor as such said, I'll pay for it. Here is how it became an instrument of reflection, of proclamation of the gospel, and of testimony. Zhu Guangqi had no interest in giving testimony as a human fact, but only of the gift he had understood and received, the grace he had put in his heart. Is the goal of this missionary month to raise up more missionaries or more witnesses? Both things, more missionary in the sense of giving first of all a conscience to us, that baptism enables me to be. Also, we cannot think that missionary activity is deligible. The other thing, one cannot be a missionary without being a witness at the same time. The fascination of vocation comes from the fact that something is witnessed that man normally does not have, does not see does not understand. Here then we must say where missionary activity begins, where witness becomes missionary activity. Well, here we enter an environment where the grace of God and the power of God cannot be codified in terms of before and after, of one, two, three, four. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. Thank you.